beyond a massive metal door. Thunder and crashes can be both heard and felt. The door clambers, shakes, and clunks with each impact. This far beneath the ocean, pressure can be far more destructive than any explosive. Leaks sprung in the door's center, spewing water and beginning to fill the loading bay of Orthus V, soon to be Lamia I. This planet's anomalous effects were never known until SUN's Prometheus Project began colonization procedures and were subsequently annihilated by an unknown force. This force, when observed through the cameras in Orthus V, was seemingly the water itself. Not just in terms of the outright demolition of the station, but even on flooding bases above that depth level, water would rush in, obscure the camera, and then drain out later, leaving what many would call a nightmarish murder scene. This caused Prometheus to enable an operation they had concocted for just such an occasion. Project Derelict was then launched, and many would believe that it was a massive success, based on its popularity now. In reality, the long-term effect of Project Derelict was a horrible thing, and they knew it. Orthus V was purchased by Prometheus, who later categorized the planet under the classification of Lamaya. This became Lamaya I, the very first instance of a Lamaya infection. This classification is easily the most dangerous job, and against my better judgment, I took it. The paper was fairly explicit, and clearly wasn't made to make you feel better. Reading. This mission is nothing for the lighthearted. When you leave, we mark you as MIA. Therefore, anything that happens to you is out of our hands. The region is hostile, and as such, we cannot often deliver supplies. We still receive data from men under the breach, so there is salvation and there is home. You will not return, and likely will die. I was shipped out in October of 2143. My ship was not made for transporting people, and I was strapped to a small bench for 50 minutes until we warped. When the cascade of light stopped, so did all sound. Deafened, and it felt as if it lasted forever. So powerful there wasn't even ringing in my ears. I can still play back the exact moment we got out of warp. We snapped into the next solar system, just above Orthus V. The light faded, and outside I witnessed an anomaly. There seemed to have been a small wrinkle in space, as it looked like a piece of the galaxy was folded where I was looking. Little did I know, it was a small hiccup of the pilot's. He punched too early, so he shot half of his ship into this galaxy and cut the hole right on the other half. Bungie effect took place. Imagine taking 15000 tons of steel, accelerating beyond the speed of light, and slamming it into a new planet. Like a slingshot, we slammed right through the atmosphere of Orthus V and collided with the ground at phenomenal speeds. I barely escaped from the ship, only taking this suit and a bag of food with me. I have my tools, so this might not be too difficult. I hope I can find salvation soon. Chandra Teske, 2145 The blistering abyss expands gently in front of me. From its murky shadows, geometric silhouettes take form, and dozens of tiny red eyes glared back from light bulbs perched atop posts. There is no geonav here. This region is so damn hostile that even a meaningless satellite runs the risk of being torn to shreds by another anomaly. Seems every year there's a new reason to fear this place. The Lamia case is complex as hell, because of all the new shit we find here. Lamia 1 is one of the more legendary planets, getting its name from brutalizing any colonization effort in unique and anomalous ways. This planet is known to be vicious and completely unforgiving. Given it's an ocean planet, we knew that colonization wouldn't be a breeze. We were very aware of that. The instantaneous problem is that this isn't an ocean of water. It's somehow denser, despite having no viscous difference. This water behaves as water does when sitting in a jar, and as such, nobody figured it would be the most lethal part of their destruction. Further analysis proved that this fluid has mostly water, of course, 
but it also has trace amounts of CSF. It's a strange microbial phenomenon, but this goes further. These proteins are all throughout the water, but so few and far between you would never notice, not dissimilar to our own oceans. But the behavior of these proteins is considered still an anomaly. If met with steel, stone, fabric, or anything that's not living tissue, essentially, nothing happens. If you were to put your bare hand into the water, the proteins would move? It's still uncertain, but when a man dipped his pinky finger into a swimming pool full of this water, the proteins within contracted in a wavy pattern, emulating the waves of the water. We knew this was just the protein, because the wave traveled with an extremely deliberate force behind it. Why would an entire ocean planet have this? There must be hundreds of millions of living tissue samples throughout the planet. Why would they have something that reacts to exactly that? It's uncertain, but we have some evidence to point our way. The light down here is fading. Blackness now crept from the horizon and infested my view. In front of me now was a dim, distant light. It was a small station, more than likely the tram. A perfect place to get my bearings. Trekking there became a hazard, however. A gargantuan chasm was right in front of me, hiding in the darkness. There was a bridge, but it wasn't in the greatest condition. By that, I mean it only has one support beam functional, and the most bridge I would have is about one foot wide, still better than trying to jump it. Creeping along the support beam was something else. Odd sounds of differing frequencies erupted from the chasm below, seemingly in response to me. I could feel the pressure. I could feel the depth, taking tremendous effort to even breathe. My shaking feet could barely fit on the beam and each movement was met by sounds beneath me. When I made it across, I nearly sprinted away from the chasm. During my flee, the terrible sound of crashing metal came from behind me. I turned to see the other side of the chasm gone. Just gone. Vanished. Only the support beam, now twisted and torn apart, loosely clinging to the side of the sand. I decided against checking inside the chasm, and instead made my way towards the tram. The bulkhead was malformed, clawed apart, and corroded by a strange substance that grew in vicious tendrils along its lips. Opening the door revealed that the substance had infested the interior of the airlock. With a powerful scree, the bulkhead skid open, ripping off rusted chunks from the exterior and tearing apart the tendrils. Slowly it closed again, sealed off the outside, and began to drain the room of water. Oxygen filled the room and the opposite door opened with a clunk. It was almost surreal walking into the tram station. Vines of viscous blackened red fluid tied from the ceiling to the floor. The tracks had congealed masses of said vines writhing together in symbiotic movements. I searched for a terminal, an interface to call the tram from. Thankfully, there was one just beside the tracks. The tram was still operational, but unable to come to this specific location. Understandably so, as the terminal claimed that well over 56% of the tram system is now overtaken by this growth. Titled M4, L0, C2, shortened to Mallow, the growth was hostile towards inanimate objects, especially metal. Looking at the congealed mass between the tracks, you could make out a strange white material that impaled the metal. From this terminal, I was able to find a base of operations, 14 miles away, 12 if I take the tunnels of the tram. I now needed to discern which tunnels were the most hostile, and which ones I could avoid. Searching the station proved useful. I came across a plasma cutter from Omic, the overhead company that handles Lamia cases. Sturdy and well-armed, this thing can slice right through a human torso and still cleanly cut a steel pipe on the other side. I also found a small box of fuel cells for it, so I was well-equipped for a fence. The station has three floors. The bottom is obviously the full station, and the second level is where I found the plasma cutter, as well as a ton of other machinery. The third level I approached with caution, 
as I could hear some form of movement coming from up there. As I slinked up the stairwell, I clicked my weapon to enable it, causing the vicious sound of plasma scorching living tissue as it warmed up. There was merely a door and the strangely robotic sound of repetitive movement. Opening the door revealed that nothing was there, aside from an assembly line. The track was continuously trying to move the parts on its belt forward, but something was blocking it. A faint greenish-blue glow emitted from inside, barely illuminating the track. I peeked inside and immediately threw myself backward onto my ass. Looking again, it remained unclear as to just what was in there. Gargantuan pustules, filled with the fluorescent greenish-blue fluid, were congealing along the face of someone. A woman, it appears, though her face was mostly overtaken by the vines I saw earlier. Her ribcage was tucked just under her chin, collapsed, and crackled. One rib jutted from the cage and impaled her eye. Within her gaping mouth were tons of these bumps, now growing along a delicate hand that was seemingly stuffed into her throat. The rest I couldn't see beyond the first growth. I began to shake violently as I gazed into her open and glazed dead eyes. A small sound came from the machine, and it moved forward, throwing the machine parts onto the ground before dumping a horrific black liquid into the room. I looked once more into the machine to see her eyes glaring back at me, seemingly pleading. Tiny whimpers could be heard over the machine's process, and as it moved, her eyes grew wider with tears welling within. I didn't have a choice. I raised my plasma cutter and aimed it at her head, closing my eyes before pulling the trigger. A mistake? That one, as I struck the pustule and her head, essentially blowing apart her jawbone and releasing the pressure inside that enormous pustule. Immediately, the effervescent fluid began to gush from the machine, the whole while she tried to scream. I kept taking shots. I too was screaming, panicked beyond all belief. It wasn't until I could see fragments of a distorted body begin to leak from the track that I finally stopped. The fluid was not melting the metal, thankfully, but it was having an intense reaction. Bubbling but never vaporizing, it seemed almost aggressive. Looking around the room trying to forget that I found yet another terminal. This one was a monitor of sorts, and could give me a full map of the tunnels, and which ones were the most infested. While I was looking for the most direct route to the base, the machine began to gurgle, so I hurried to find said base. It was titled Lamia Delta One, and some light info on its past revealed that it has been here for over three decades. I would need to travel along the Delta Line, which had numerous intersections, and an overall infestation rate of 12%, the most concentrated region of which was right here. So long as I can get past the initial section, I should be golden. A glimmer of hope filled my chest and was quickly snuffed out by the gurgling growing into moaning. A woman's pained voice began to emit delicately from the machine as it ground to a halt. I turned around to see that almost the entire floor was dark red fluid with writhing tendrils half fallen from the mouth of the assembly line. They undulated in a hypnotic fashion from left to right. They flexed like muscle and never missed a beat. Though that isn't anything compared to what it dumped out. A mass of molten muscle tissue with the remnants of her cranium now lay in front of it. Connected directly to the mass were many chunks of brain tissue and an unbelievable amount of wire-like strands connected themselves directly to her exposed and dangling spinal column which was held aloft by her decimated torso. Exposed lungs expanded and contracted in a slow rhythm, and on each contraction, the moan resumed. I bolted down the stairs, getting as far away from it as possible. I leapt across the tracks and sprinted towards the maintenance bulkhead that led directly into the Delta Line. I tore open the door and slammed it shut when I was through. No airlock this time, even though the Delta Line was half flooded. All around me were slow-moving, spindly tendrils that erupted from a pustule-ridden mass of human corpses piled on the main bulkhead. When I moved, the tendrils closed in on me. Gently, they wrapped around my leg, 
but not before I could get out of reach. I booked it down the tracks, passed a ton of these masses, and eventually made it to the other side. Now, it was just me, this tunnel, and a lot of pitch dark water. Twelve miles to go. The water was black. Thick globules clung to swirling masses of the substance, and were ever more present the further I went. Though the overall contamination level of this place is relatively low, that doesn't mean that a miniature interlocutor cannot begin a small colony here. In tiny patches, no more than a few feet across at most, hair-like strands stretched out from grassy spots, dotted within the patches, were more of those boils. They emitted a dim light, which reacted with the proteins in the water, enabling a sort of bioluminescent phosphor effect. I could see quite clearly, even when the overhead lamps were out. Everything underneath the water was illuminated with a dull green color, with splatters of red and black inkish clouds that gently molded to my movements. What I witnessed in the station was an absolute nightmare, one which haunted me. Her eyes still consumed my mind, causing my thoughts to ruminate. Over and over, I played back the scene, analyzing every moment where I could have done something. The fear I felt was unlike any I had suffered before, paralyzing yet intoxicating. Even with the thoughts, and even with my environment being so passive-aggressive, I felt a sense of calm. My pace was slow and steady, my eyes were fixated on the ground, and my mind was completely at ease. More troublesome was the environment, as it felt like the tunnels themselves weren't consistent. Some tunnels would be marked appropriately with basic signs stating which tunnel is which. I was in tunnel C12, which loops into the overhead tunnel A3. A3 wraps over to the D network, where the base was located. I would enter a tunnel that clearly stated A3, and then I would find an intersection that stated B8 and D5, despite me not being anywhere near those networks. I would keep walking until I found A3 again. The overhead network, A, is easily identifiable as the tunnels are wider and the tracks are bigger. I eventually found yet another A3 tunnel, and only then did I think about which tunnel network I had actually been traveling through. I turned around to find complete and utter darkness. Pitch black. No noise. No nothing. The water seemed to stagnate near the darkness. It occurred to me that I wasn't following tracks either. Under my feet was simply stone, and all around me was more of it. There was a gargantuan hole that led to an even larger tunnel. That tunnel was the one marked A3. Believe me, I wanted to leave. I wanted to simply go through the hole and be on my way. But I couldn't. There was a presence in the cave alongside me. No panic overwhelmed me this time, despite seeing something move. More strands of the substance waved towards me, as if something approached, then turned around just before the light. I can't use this plasma cutter underwater. Defenseless, I stood there, waiting for something. The sounds of the water lapping just above me now crept in, and the strong current of something enormous moved. Along with the current, a moan of incredible depth erupted from the darkness, and now in view was the beginning of a maw. A maw I had never dreamt of seeing. One large pillar of crushed enamel speared the darkness. Yet the enamel looked off. When I say crushed, I mean compressed. As if hundreds of teeth were pressurized into this one mass. Simply a cursory observation, one that was useless. The pillar moved forward, revealing the lower mandible of something. Slowly, I backed towards the hole ensuring my feet kicked up no sand and made very little impact on the surrounding waters. Step by step, I moved out of the way. From the side, I could see tendrils gripping the teeth towards the base. They flexed as my gaze passed over them. The teeth fell to the floor and scraped along the stones. The creature moaned as it passed through, tearing apart anything on the sea floor with its horrific tusks. When the teeth weren't in view, 
A horrid mass of congealed and blackened tendons revealed itself. A quick flex, and the flesh opened to reveal an eye. Cloudy, but taller than me. The whole creature took up the entirety of the cavern, so I backed right into Tunnel A3. When my feet touched the ground, I snapped to attention. All panic now consumed me. My thoughts ran away from logic, and my sense of reality began to stagger. In no documentation, no report, no briefing was there any hint of this creature's existence, making me assume that most don't get out of the cavern. Suddenly, as quickly as the panic came, it left, replacing the sensation with euphoric lethargy. My joy at being alive was counteracted by the terrible feeling of waking from a dream. Perhaps I was unconscious, in a fugue state, throughout my travels. Looking down tunnel A3, I could see C12, and a suspiciously massive hole just before the turn. My mistake, though, was I was not only in a post-trance drowsiness, but I had no idea how long I was in that state for. Despite this, I trudged on. I don't know how long I walked, but I eventually made it to a crossroads of sorts. Terrifying as it was, I could get my bearings there. The contamination of this sector is incredibly high. Caution is king under here, apparently. The passageway leading into this crossroads was black, swarming with tendrils and twitching ulcers filled with green fluid. The crossroads directed me toward the nearby dry tunnel D4. There's a maintenance shaft that runs through the walls. It can get me around the collapse that blocks it off. I have to hope that the maintenance shaft is intact as well. D4 isn't a transit line. It was an automated porter network of drones that would deliver supplies to various outposts. Delta was the first of these lines that was constructed strictly for the science division. Meaning that if this ooze was a subject broken free, samples of it could be throughout the tunnel. Unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be too far off from the truth. Looking down the narrow shaft that will bring me to D4 fills me with trepidation unlike any other. Those invisible millipedes with syringes for legs that crawl carelessly and viciously through your spine, wrapping and weaving around your ribcage, tickling the muscles, encouraging you to move, to twitch, to flail, to scream. One light emits a powerful light, illuminating a mass that clings to the rockfall, resulting in the collapse. That mass moves, it undulates, and grips the rocks with incredible strength. There seems to be a protrusion that rests just on the pinnacle, but I can't make it out from here. The shaft also wasn't in view. I would need to approach and investigate it with this thing sitting right there. There's gotta be another way. Looking at the map in the crossroads reveals that yes, Beta Line does connect to Delta. 26 miles from here, half of that is retreading this ground. If I go through this maintenance shaft, and get to that dry line. It would take me only another four to get to where I need to go. If I were to take the beta access, then it would be going through six miles of the alpha line as well. Worse yet, the only exterior access shaft nearby is connected directly to that very maintenance shaft. Just wonderful. Being on the surface means being subject to this planet's nighttime predators. Scant few have been recorded, and those that have painted a bleak picture before. I'm trapped. I'm actually trapped. I peered down the delta tunnel again, and this time the mass was moving off the rocks, directly towards me. I shot from my position at the map, and immediately searched for a hiding spot. The best I could do was a small outcrop left from falling rocks in the roof. I pinned myself to the stones with my legs, and held myself aloft with my arms. If I was spotted, there wouldn't be any escape attempt to make. The thing was closing in now, speeding up it seemed. I could hear the sounds of breaking and crunching underneath gooey and squishy paste, with a deep and aggressive groan emitted from the creature, bouncing off the cave walls and directly through me. When I say aggressive, I mean that it was emitted with intent. It must have. No creature can make that sound otherwise. 
high notes seemingly shot directly through my body like bullets, igniting my muscles to move once the pitch was reached, all blanketed in dysmorphic, low-toned moaning. As it sounded, I clamored and stumbled in place, attempting to keep myself from spasming off the wall. I could genuinely feel the noise as it bounced off the wall and through my back. Soon it was in the room. In a heartbeat, it pushed a globule of its body through the opening and seemingly inflated almost instantly, carrying with it the audible sound of crunching and squashing. Whatever made up the solid mass of that being somehow clicks back into place after breaking. Rapid regeneration is impossible, we've yet to observe it in any life form. With the noise came its visage, a melted droplet of pitch black ink congealed into one writhing body. Its skeleton stuck out in spear-like protrusions. They pointed themselves towards any noise that occurred, no matter how minor. This makes a very strange effect. I was able to watch as the bones moved and swirled through its body. It's strangely hypnotizing, and I myself was caught in its effects. Thankfully, nothing came of it. No voice shot from the creature to stun me, so I merely remained in place. Swiftly, it moved through the crossroads, blanketing many things, including the map, in black ink that made it impossible to identify. It fled down the beta line, likely headed for Alpha or the C line. Without wasting a breath, I descended from my hiding spot and quickly booked it for the D4 tunnel. As I ran, my mind swarmed with thoughts so powerful they could blind me, and quickly they did. Soon, I could barely run at all, and all audio came through a filter that broke it down to its bare vibrations. My eyes saw everything in the dark, including those that possibly lurk there. I was somewhere else, but I could recognize the light blue bulbs that decorate the maintenance shaft. I ducked in, sliding through the entry on my side. When I stopped, I could see perfectly down the tunnel. The lights were out, and the access shaft was completely fine. The green light of the airlock tempted me. Just above me, however, was a ladder leading to the outside. Unfortunately, the only barrier between me and the airlock was the nest of ventilation that was now in a terrific clamor over my intrusion. My heart pounded in my chest, my eyes twitched and skittered in dire accordance to the screeching horrors that infest this place, and they fixated on the green light at the end of the tunnel. I moved. Only one arm had sensation in it, so I pulled myself forward with that. The metal grating beneath me could reveal the creatures that scream, but I kept my gaze on that light. Inch by inch, I skid across the entire shaft to reach the other side. It was a person-sized funnel that went directly into the airlock. I attempted to stand in this funnel, but my legs had no sensation either. With one arm, I pulled myself to that door, lifted myself, and pulled the lever to enable the airlock. As it flooded, I swore I heard someone scream in there and a face that watched me from its window. I shot back in complete fear. All sensation had returned. All noise had silenced, and the airlock door opened with a glimmering soft light emitting from within. I entered and enabled the pumps, and a quick scan suggested I be in depressurization for 16 hours, even directing me to a facility nearby. It scanned its interior found no living inhabitants, found hostile inhabitants, and decided to pressurize the entire D4 tunnel to my body's specific requirements. As this was happening, I fought for the ability to stay awake. Despite being startled, it felt more like my heart was bleeding and deflating. My lungs felt weak, and my legs struggled to hold me upright. As the water drained, this was exacerbated as this planet has quite the gravitational field. It yanked me down, and I couldn't fight the will to fall. I was on my knees, tears streamed from my eyes, and I collapsed to the floor asleep. The timer was set to 15 hours, 55 minutes, and 12 seconds. Nchim. I woke up to the terrible sound of a buzzer muffled by ringing and squealing. A steel-plated bench had automatically pulled out just above me. The dimmed green lights grew bright white and the door hissed as it slipped into the floor. I rose to my feet, 
slightly wobbly but nothing extreme. I hobbled to the terminal, which did me the gracious favor of scanning me and sending it to a nearby data center. I couldn't make sense of all the results. A couple of areas were red, namely my throat, chest, and my head. Fractures in my ankle, low circulation in one arm because of trauma, and the other cause I slept on it. Oh yeah, it's gonna be a fun day. I exited the airlock. Thankfully the pressurization was spot on, and I wasn't in any degree of physical discomfort. The lights were fairly bright from the inside. They seem much dimmer now. In its darkest corners I could see growths of the black ichor, reeling and writhing in strange motions. An unfortunate byproduct of my recent encounter is a strange shaking. In no way can I be still. My eyes still analyze everything a hundred times a second, just to ensure that it's real. At the very least, I'm in the Delta Line. A nearby map console ensured me that I was, in fact, in the Delta Line. Less than four miles left till I can get to a functional station. The problem is that two miles of it are apparently locked down. While there is a perfectly serviceable maintenance shaft, the time on this face of the planet is 2243. I contemplated my next move as I walked along the drone tracks, still somehow operational. Massive canisters filled with any number of ingredients were being held aloft by a large hook and claw, which directed it along the track. All along the way, scans were being performed to ensure the safety of the package, who it was being delivered to. I'm hoping to find out. Despite the working lights and operating drones bringing some measure of security to me, I still felt terrible. Like I was going to vomit at any moment. My body languished, heavy arms and steel legs. All the while my lungs were sporadically breathing, suffocating sometimes and other times hyperventilating. My mind was awash in the watercolor blur of thoughts and emotions as well as the creeping exhaustion that's been looming since I woke up. Of course, this all was only happening because of the disparity that had set in. You can't see it from the airlock, but it turns out that the entire tunnel has collapsed, with only half a mile to work with. Still, the maintenance shaft was fine. In fact, it was eerily close to the collapse. I felt the odd desire to run back to the map and check, so I did. And yes, it indeed claimed that the collapse was two miles away and that the deliveries were proceeding as normal using the exterior track. Drones feel no fear, so we figured they could survive just fine on the surface. Well, there's a reason it's not the default. The drones may feel no fear, but they can do little to survive in the face of the larger predators. The exterior track, in fact, emits a whirring sound one which attracts the creatures, though that only remains a theory. Still, I went to the collapse and found it once again, maintenance shaft, and everything still there. I chose to cave in and just go through the shaft, might as well, anything to get me out of here. I walked over to the red-lit ladder and began to ascend, counting my steps as if they were my last. Thirty-eight in case you were curious. When I got to the latch, something stopped, my heart dropped, and my ears began to ring once more, this time extremely loudly. I felt as though something was off. My eyes twitched back and forth, once again in accordance with a strange sound. A lower frequency, one that pounded on the eardrums directly, quivering your body, forfeiting your thoughts while ignoring your actions. Though all remained quiet, all remained still, all remained calm, this sound was becoming more and more palpable, alongside a slightly higher frequency, still lower in tone. There was something else in those noises too, a strange yet pronounced increase in the audio, almost like a roar. A sudden rise in intensity, and then it drifts back to normal. When it's normal, it's ringing. The roar began again, but this time faster, like a laugh it had a certain number of rises, each one breaking my eardrum further. I never quite considered that collapse, 
I merely caught a cursory glance at it twice. Come to think of it, not a single one of those canisters fell off the line. It was just rubble. And as this thought came to my head, the frequency giggled once more. This sent a balloon of paranoia into my chest, instantly inflating it with the acidic anxiety that I had grown so used to down here. My hands clutched the latch handle for dear life. I couldn't look down. Instead, I glared into the barrier between me and yet another evil. If I go back, there's something else down here. Tears began to well in my eyes as my arms shook violently. I couldn't help but whimper as I turned that valve. In an instant, I was flooded with dense, powerful water. I only then realized that I hadn't pressurized the shaft. I was taking on the entire weight of the ocean on top of the weight of this gravity. Slam. I collided with the ground, turning everything black as the frequencies erupted from the door that was now at my side. Didn't take long to awake. I figured I was dead. And it certainly felt that way when I opened my eyes. The glass on my helmet was cracked. Somehow it didn't collapse. My arms and legs cracked and popped as I rose to my feet. With all the elegance of a drunken sailor, I threw myself up and up that ladder. The whole while, all audio was being attuned to broken melodies and horrid frequencies. The pitches shifted, the volume stuttered, and my skull racketed back and forth as I ascended. My neck was limp, my chest was barely fluttering light breaths, and I was quickly blinded by sheer blue lights. Not the kind I have seen, not the kind that indicates hostility. Rather, it was the blue glow of the ocean above. When my feet hit the sand, it was surreal. I could see for miles, and I could even see the delta base I've been hunting for. Directly ahead of me was a plateau, on which all of our bases were built. These plateaus all have separate trenches between them, each going so deep we stopped searching for a bottom. Off to my left was the outstretched hand of the abyss, the gargantuan hole that we have been studying. Though I'm not presently near any, there are a number of steel ropes holding the Alpha Base aloft in the center of the chasm, and you can theoretically climb them all the way down to the base itself. However, the Abyss harbors some of the more vicious creatures, all of them large and very powerful. The largest we have recorded, titled L1D2 or Mama, lurks in that Abyss. We've seen its back. It is the seafloor down there, and every now and then it moves when it does an uncountable amount of terrors and horrors fling from the abyss into the open waters. When it is there, you can look down into the enormous hole with some measure of security. If you spot hundreds of thousands of glowing blue dots, then Mama is home. When she's not, there is nothing. Absolutely nothing down there. Hell, you can't even tell where the Alpha Base is without some lights. We haven't found a bottom to that hole, but then again, we haven't been able to explore it. Off to my right is a strong fear object, a massive collection of downed spacecraft. Hundreds, thousands, possibly more. Anything that tries to investigate this place gets killed before any information can be received. Fun fact. This place has only four known creatures that inhabit it. Yet those four only account strictly for three instances. Mama has never attacked anyone, never shown any aggression or interaction in general. This means that out of hundreds of instances of aggression, only three creatures have ever been recorded to do it. All of them are massive. All of them are in the graveyard to my left. My fear object comes from ships and starcrafts being underwater. Any moving metal object makes my skin crawl, and my muscles twitch when it's beneath the waves. I only know of one creature in there, the only one they felt like telling me about, Armadin. A large, serpentine creature with two articulate arms at the front. It latches onto the ships and propels itself off them with remarkable understanding of its mass, showing little fear and less remorse. Supposedly, it was discovered when a starship carrying a vessel, built specifically to survive the crash and operate underwater, was downed. 
the small sub that survived managed to remove itself from the starship, and its video logs were being relayed directly through Station Lamia Prime back to SUN's Prometheus. What it showed was a nightmare unlike any other, and it was being streamed publicly to millions of outposts aside from Prometheus, all showing the failure that was Project Derelict. This is where we got our first glimpse at the seabed in full detail, and where we first got to see the graveyard. After fumbling the sub for 40 minutes trying not to slam into all the metal spears around the place, the sub eventually began to rise above the graveyard. They landed smack dab in the center, and they couldn't believe their eyes. No matter where they looked, even with the best visibility they couldn't find the end to the graveyard. Just more and more ships piled on one another, each crushed underneath the sea's tremendous weight. A very clear roar was heard over the stream, even jamming the audio feed a bit with its intensity. And within five seconds flat, a creature rose from a wreck directly in front of them. Two articulated arms, two heads with two eyes each, a gaping maw at the bottom, and many tendrils that extruded from its base. It emerged, leapt for the sub, and then the feed went dark. Hats the Armadon. The fact that the station is within sight is still a monumental leap for me and I was quickly closing in on its location. Unfortunately, one of the trenches lay just outside the base's borders. I could see bubbles rising from some rooms. I saw functional equipment and surveillance all over. I could even see dis-dams, large mechanized exosuits that protect you from crush depth and can perform a variety of industrial tasks even underneath the ocean. There were people there, just before me, however, was the tremendous abyss. The bridge was out, and it looks like it's been abandoned. Perhaps they have a reason for staying away from this plateau. None of the support beams rose high enough for me to leap off them. There was nothing connecting the two landmasses. My best bet was to walk along the exterior drone tram, which was a foot-wide iron pole with intermittent drones that screech across and can electrocute you if you're too close to where it connects to the pole. Granted, I only see a drone every five minutes maybe, but I am not willing to take chances. The only other option would be to walk over to the graveyard. A large carrier vessel collapsed almost directly on the trench, leaving its wreckage as a bridge. It's not too far but I can hear many things already moving around in there. Metal groans. Sometimes it crashes, roars, growls, clicks. A grandiose clamor, unlike anything you've experienced. My body ached, and walking any farther than I need to is nothing that I can perceivably do. I began to panic. Lowering myself on one knee, I held my helmet and glared at the crack. That rampant discord of audio began once more interpreting everything as disjointed voices and half-hearted drunken melodies. A ticking had begun in my left ear, and ringing in the right. My vision was gone, blurred out of existence from my constant attempts to fixate on the glass crack, and my paranoia yanking my vision to and fro. Just when it all seemed like it was going to fade again, a glimmer of hope appeared. A massive metal bulkhead thundered open, and three people walked out in suits similar to mine. I had to notify them somehow, so I turned on my plasma cutter and began to trigger it above my head. Thankfully, they did notice, and we scrambled about trying to find a similar frequency. No luck. Looks like we were going to have to do this without a single word spoken. Still, I could see their faces, the concern they had, and the defense one took. We eventually settled, after a while of gesturing back and forth with our hands on the idea that I need to make the jump, and they'll try to catch me. They tried to assure me of something, but I wasn't clear on it. Still, I took the leap, giving my entire body to the ocean, hoping to God that it pities me this once. It did, somehow. When my feet left the sand, Almost instantly a current lifted my body. It wasn't enough to clear the entire gap, but I was grabbed by the people waiting on the other side. A hand gripped mine with incredible strength, and I was lifted to my feet. 
As I rose, however, my heart sank once more. The lethargy had reappeared, and suddenly I was in a fugue state. When my vision passed the ledge, I realized that there was really only one person. It was a she, and she lifted me up, looked at my face with great concern, and mouthed very clearly the words, Are you okay? I collapsed once again, though I was still conscious. I was frustrated, not knowing what was real and what wasn't, and I guess I gave up. Just completely. She dragged me into the airlock, and with a powerful yet calm whir, I drifted into sleep. Lights flickered in obtuse shapes, whirling and spinning around my eyes. I opened them to find no helmet, just a hand and a flashlight. Calm voices that I couldn't understand, and pains I could barely explain. My ribs, all of them, felt as if I had just crawled out from being asleep under a boulder. My spine twinges and twitches, lurching my body when the pain strikes, spiking my eyes with poppies of color. My skull throbbed and pulsed, my legs ached and tensed, and all around me, my world dribbled into existence. Slowly, calmly, the peace passes over me like a knife edge to the skin, barely pressed but moving quickly. Within moments I was gored once more by my pain, a side effect of my tension. Above me were plastic masks, behind those were faces covered in another mask, and they had tools. One of them delicately placed their finger on my tongue and forced my mouth open. It was at that moment that I realized I was actually numb, completely from head to toe. I couldn't feel a damn thing. All I could feel was the panicked warmth in my chest from my heart's urge to palpitate and its medical prohibition from such a simple act. I heard tools clicking vaguely as iron and steel rods were placed in my maw. Were they sticking those tools into my gums? Did I still have a tongue? Rampant, discarded thoughts of grandiose and random topics started to disease and fester my brain. I tensed. Or at least I assume I did. I started to question how long I'd been here. These two would move in strange ways that made them hard to track, and my thoughts rampaged forward with reckless, skin-ripping, tooth-shattering anxiety. I believed them to be ghosts. At one point, I even believed one of them to be wearing red. All effects of whatever anesthesia they gave me, and however high the dosage was. When I fully woke, nobody was present, but I could see clearly. Looking down whilst getting up showed me a teal medical gown with little dark green polka dots all over it. My hands felt like cushions, and my feet felt like clouds. I swayed my skull to the side, feeling its intangible weight. My mouth was… fine. It hadn't been harmed somehow. While I would have loved to have found a mirror to admire my smile with, I instead settled for collapsing on the ground and nearly shattering that smile. I managed to recoil and rise, and I took the time to regain my balance. The room I was in was undoubtedly a medical ward, one with all of the latest technology. Aside from a few seemingly unorthodox tools, the entire place was most assuredly prepared for any medical emergency. Perhaps the people were too. I clambered to the door, barely keeping upright, and touched a clean glass panel to open it. A hideous squeal emitted while it opened, heavy metal with little protection on its tracks. The hallway was clean, incredibly chilly, all a cold blue that fades gently into the gray-white that dominates its palette. Two ways to go, I banked right and booked it down the hall. I passed two doors, and at the end of the hall was one more, much bigger, but with a blaring red signal saying out of service on it. To my left was the central area, a living room of sorts. Comfortable chairs, a large TV, a coffee table, and a small surround sound setup. There was even a half-eaten bag of chips left on one of the chairs. It felt strange, like standing on the precipice of normal. I was completely shocked, glaring at the room, simply amazed that humans even found some comfort all the way down here. 
Perpendicular to the entrance I came through was the other one, which had a massive bulkhead at the end and around three doors on either side. I approached the bulkhead to find it slightly ajar. The actual airlock had no water in it, thankfully, but there was about a four-inch wide gap in the door's horizontal teeth. Once again, there was a hall to my left, and it connected right back to the medical room I came from. There was the dire and persistent scent of salt water mixed alongside steel. That, and a fumigating scent of disinfectant masked with the tart odor of lemon. Made all the sweeter by the cleanliness. Not a speck. At least not here. The door off to the right of the medical room, the one at the end of the hall, is locked down. The floor I was on was clearly the living quarters, with only one lab and medical. The rest of the station and its equipment must be through that door. I pressed whatever buttons I could find. I ripped off a panel or two and found these lovely wires that if you disconnect them and join them together, force the door open. This was my first mistake. The light inside flickered violently, powerful and vicious oozing and splotching sounds as if some viscous fluid was being regurgitated and swallowed through a powerful and obnoxious clicking sack. On the wall was a person, or what looked to be the living remains of a person. Still twitching and lurching, one eye clear through the mangled twine now stitched into the metal. Half of it was recognizable, but the other half was strictly yarn. It belched, and you could hear another pressure bubble move for just a moment before a large section of her spinal column exploded from within. Fluids of barely recognizable color sprayed in a vicious arch, splattering the wall. Just as this occurred, the flesh between the wound and the yarn was slowly pulled across the metal in gruesomely organized patterns, eventually culminating in a sheer mass of person being sewn into a wall, the chunk of jaw still visible and twitching maniacally in painful discourse. No voice was heard, nor was it needed. My terror was already immense. Someone appeared from a nearby stairwell, holding a weapon. Immediately, a sharp spear penetrated the strobe-lit horror, and he began to chop it down. The sounds like taut leather being stripped to its bare minimum and stretched to its absolute maximum, a gushy hack with the effective comparison being slicing through wet silicone bushes with a cleaver. The whiplash recoil with a slapped sound to top off every slit end. My eyes were fixated on the one untouched as it remained so throughout, the thing was watching me. It was locked onto me before being slashed apart. The first chop made it flinch and tense with a terrible ripping sound, and after that, its gaze was tossed upwards where it continued to violently wobble and shake in response to every single break. I panicked, searching for anything to assist with the cutdown process. I scrambled around, stamped, and stormed. The whole while, a blurred voice screamed incoherent gibberish to me, only being interrupted by the distinct and clear sound of more hacking, more muscles, more taut flesh. I was losing my mind, completely in a whirl I couldn't see. Eventually, my vision was regained, but with some distinct differences. I could see it squirming on the ground. A distant voice of a woman, copper scent filled my lungs, and a new clarity of terrible origin began. I saw no people, just their flesh. I saw their minds and their expansion. I watched them grow and die. Three of them. A tall woman who was frantically pursuing me with a rather poignant needle. A slightly shorter, older man violently hacking at the flesh, assisted by a larger man. Both screamed as they viciously pounded the pained creature, forcing it to tense into a ball and begin to squeal. The imagery beyond this point exceeds my capacity to explain, as I believe myself to be on my deathbed. I remember waking up again afterward, having the return to normal rush my blood back into me. I awoke on the couch in the living area I saw before. The woman was above me with long hair and a gentle voice. I couldn't understand her for the life of me. All I remember hearing was four words. Those words I never forgot. Anomalous. 
independent. Vessel. Synthesis. They still ring out from time to time in my head. I cracked the code further on, but I still hear them how they were. I came to, finally, on that couch. Looking around, I saw nobody there, just a device on the table. Handheld, it's quite portable. One LED monitor read the word page, and on the side was a button. I clicked it and the monitor blinked. The word on the screen changed to wait, only to blink once more and return to its initial word. I didn't think I'd wake up with a pager next to me. I thought these people were prepared. I stood up and felt my weight on my feet, arguably the greatest sensation I had ever felt at the time. I could see clearly. My stance was only slightly wobbly, and I could hear some things. There was the rhythmic pounding of something blobby and metallic coming from behind me. I swung around to see an old man approaching me with his hands out. His mouth was moving, but what came through was only gibberish. I saw him more clearly as he approached. His hands were rough and obviously callous to the point of solidity on the skin of the palms. Fingers of dry skin and bony structure slightly nicked and scratched by various equipment. His arms matched his hands, though the dorsal end of his arms were mallets of steel skin. His arms were vicious and vascular, one tattoo of a rose on his right, one slightly masked by his rolled-up tee underneath an overcoat. His face was gruff. He had a brilliant beard that curled neatly, tucking itself under his chin. His eyes were sunken and blue, his brow furled slightly, and scratches and a scar beneath his right cheekbone. His gaze was locked on me as he expounded further in tongues, only to my confusion. Didn't take long for him to gesture at the couch, which I presumed meant to sit the hell down. I sat, and he walked in front of me. The metal sounded like ice crackling in a dome. He got into my face and began to mouth words at me while speaking a strange language. I looked at him with astonishment, as to me his lips had been melting. I looked at him to find an expecting gaze, like there was a response I must give. What? I think I said, with a lengthy drone of my own voice shearing into the background as I spoke. He shook his head. It didn't take a genius to say I was deaf or at least I couldn't hear things clearly. Sounds shifted, slipped, dissipated, and disappeared. Distant mechanized footsteps and pulsating vessels filling out the interiors of the rocks are all I could hear in the empty ambience. That alongside the growing angelic choir of beeping and buzzing electronics of various shapes, sizes, and sounds, intensified to a point beyond recognition, Every sound is jammed and encrypted with a code I'd never find. My vision was in a constant stammer. Though I could see fine, my waking consciousness was that of an old TV being flicked through by a bored teenager. Constant flickering halted my thoughts, though the lights never changed. My eyes blacked out every so often for around half a second, demolishing whatever formless thought I happened to be contemplating. Now and again they'd twitch jerking to the sides or up above, as if evading fixation. That's the appropriate description. My mind was evading fixation entirely. Every time I'd blink or black out, the old man was in a different position, looking at me with increasing concern. My mind was just that, a TV being flicked through, and it happened to land on one channel that I could finally fixate on. The man held out a familiar patch, one I was wearing. A red derelict patch, with our moniker the Blue Rose, and the words Flos Oxidere encircling it. I nodded, revealing my badge, and the man's head hung in disappointment once more. He started to move in much clearer motions. I could blink, and he wouldn't have changed positions. Slowly my mind was turning on, but not my hearing. A shrill and wobbly sound emitted from behind me, followed by an intense growl. Two individuals made themselves clear and present, the tall lady and the tall man. The man used some device to scan the interior of my skin and the lady began to speak with the older gentleman. Surreal doesn't even begin to describe this. 
My assignment was to assist the inhabitants in recovering from a latent disaster and to help them crack into one of the two anomalies present here. Here I am, anomalously affected to the point of incoherent deafness. The man scanning me showed the screen of his device. It claimed my skin had a 12% mallow infection. I looked up to him with concern. His face was young, but masked by a cap that cast a rather dense shadow. Long, light brown hair that's untamed and stringy, two bulbous eyes, and a reassuring smirk cast back at me. The lady was kind enough to grab my arm and yank me away to the medical bay, with the other two in tow, discussing things. The squeaky clean floors, made all the more bright by the fluorescent bulbs above, gave me a strange comfort. The lady sat me down, grabbed some pieces of paper and some pencils, and began to write hurriedly. The other two entered the room, and she swiftly gave them some of the pieces of paper. The veteran held the first, and took the liberty of going first, flipping the slip around. I saw the name Ron, written on it, with a nearby gesture pointing to himself. I nodded, looking to the taller, younger man, who flipped his paper around to reveal Maxie written on it. The lady went last. She flipped her first card, which revealed her name to be Elsa. And with a smile, she flipped the other one over, with it reading, We need to scan your head, in cheery, almost hauntingly sweet handwriting. She quickly wrote down on another card, What can you hear? As she passed me a piece of paper and the pencil, I wrote down the most apt description I could for exactly how they sounded as they talked, and the ambient noises I was suddenly privy to. While I did this, Elsa readied one of the machines and Maxie ran off somewhere. Ron remained by. He was examining me. I assumed it made him a tad bit irritated to see a new derelict down here. To think, too, he's gotten to be so old, that's such a rarity in this program. Completely against statistics. Our line of work is terrifyingly high stakes. We sometimes are dropped on planets where we're expected to wage a war with a god. On lighter days, we're exposed to human flesh, mutating on the spot. Creatures capable of annihilating planets. Weapons of extraordinarily mass destruction, lying dormant for years with a need for deactivation. Not only that, but even with a clean record like mine. No injuries, that is. Your chances of making it past 40 in this line of work are pretty much nil. I couldn't decipher by just looking at him, but he appeared to be in his 60s. White hair trimmed down to the scalp, gruff beard with a hunch to his back thousand yards stare with cold eyes. I've never seen a veteran derelict before. Hell some are expected to die during training, especially trauma protocol. Eventually, Elsa snatched the paper out of my hands and began examining it. The whole while, she brought a terrifying ceiling-mounted helmet over to me, thrice the size of my head. It had all manner of probes and electrodes seemingly hot-jacked into position. The only comfort was four leather straps that kept the metal mass from breaking your neck. She put it on my skull. Tight fit, but it worked. The machine clicked on, and I swear to God, I could hear the electricity travel through its wires and ignite its mechanized joints. Just above my skull was a careful yet quick oscillation, like someone using a corkscrew on your cranium. To my right, calculated and careful clicking noises with gentle taps and presses to my scalp. Off my left was the growing murmur of computational engineering, deafening in comparison to the rest, and on the back of the helmet was the dim crackle of electricity traveling through what I can only hope to be this thing's main line. To put it simply, this helmet shows you the eighth circle of hell, and when it was removed, I was filled with immediate relief, then terror. The helmet was still processing what it had found, and it streamed the information to a nearby wall-mounted monitor. Looking at the screen, I couldn't tell you anything. It was a mess of various measurements and calculations. Soon, the screen read the word, tracing. 
Another paper was given to me. Pardon the wait. We're looking for traces of anomalies. Then another. Your eardrums have a small amount of mallow on them. I looked down at the paper in shock, then back up at her with confusion. She sighed, grabbed a full sheet of paper and began writing diligently. Her hands were delicate, rocking across the paper as if no pencil was present. She seemingly painted words. Her face was incredibly young, rounded yet fierce, with brilliant blue eyes. Her hair draped just below the ears in a rather solid A-line, and upon her nose rested a pair of librarian-esque glasses. I searched her outfit for a clue. Was she also a derelict? This was proven wrong when I saw no patch on her right arm, but rather one on her left. Black patch, red cross. She may be from the same company, but she's definitely no derelict, perhaps a healer. Maxie re-entered the room with a couple of files and a larger cryogenic canister tucked awkwardly under his arm. I looked up and down his outfit as well. He did have a patch, but it was incredibly unfamiliar. Bright white background and black text. Go Sock. I never heard of them, Omic, Hammer, and Slate, Sun, but not Go Sock. I pointed at the patch, and Maxie pulled it forward, examining it. Swiftly, he snatched a pencil and began jotting down as well. I looked at the veteran, whose eyes became fixated on my own badge. The first to finish writing was Elsa. She handed me a paper full of brilliant scriptures, describing exactly how my eardrum came into contact with and eventually sought symbiosis with the mallow. Supposedly, the suit I was wearing wasn't built to survive here, let alone come into contact with mallow. Passed right through the fabric on my neck, or perhaps it weaseled its way through my helmet. After it latches onto the skin, its anomalous properties are nearly instantly revealed. It begins to inchworm its way toward any organ it can find. In reality, the specimen picks a direction and starts investigating. Eventually, most people have the mallow make its way to their heart or other organs. Down here, cuts and wounds are commonplace. And the parasite will not go for distant or hard to find organs. She stated that not only is it rare for the mallow to ignore my primary organs, but it's never been seen within the eardrum. She also claimed that there was a good chance it was in my teeth and mouth. Hence the examination from earlier, though further testing was required. Finally, the paper ended off with a quick statement. I'm a nurse, but I've been working with anomalies since the beginning of my career. You're in safe hands. Arguably the nicest thing I had heard in ages. The second page came to me, describing a company called GoSock that apparently does commercial grade shipping across the galaxy delivering everything from handheld electronics and knickknacks to weaponry and living bodies. Maxi here has been with Gosok for a number of years, though he didn't specify, and he was incredibly willing to describe his reasons for being under here as one of their employees. He got offered by Omic, the ones running this base now, an unhealthy sum of cash if he lent his talents to this base. To be honest, I've heard the same thing myself. I was offered a pay of around 400k, which sounded great until I was halfway through training, and they told me they spent most of it on my training process. I ended up walking away with only 120k, and that's not counting how much this mission cost for the company. God forbid they know what happened to that ship I crashed on. The nurse began typing on her keyboard with obscene speed, clicking a number of times, before the audible sound of a printer came into line. She waited by the printer, clicking her slightly long, well-maintained nails together and tapping her toe over and again. She tore the paper from the machine's grasp and poured over it, while Ron took a strange scanner to the side of my head. It beeped a succession of clearly different toned beeps, then he pulled it away. His face was concerned, but it was that resting concern most old people obtain after the years. He murmured some gibberish. It was replied to with even more from Elsa. Being unable to understand things but able to hear is strange, like being able to see without definition. The next thing handed to me was a notepad, a full one, with a torn out sheet resting on top with writing on it. It read, 
The mallow has infected further than we assumed, but it diverted down a path we haven't seen before. Regularly it spreads to various organs in the body, taking them over and eventually repurposing them. This begins in the blood vessels. If it reaches your heart, it'll be ten times harder to get out, and it quietly seeps through your organs, so you're none the wiser until the worst. The best indicator is darker, thicker blood. Now this is what we assumed would happen, but after it infected your eardrum, for some reason it chose to continue through your bone mass of all things. It stretched all the way up the side of your skull and wrapped around your right cheekbone. While it may spread into your ocular cavity, it has thus far avoided joints and pinches on your skull, so it's been traveling along the smooth face of bone. It's easy to see once it's under the right light but with enough antibiotics or bacteriophage treatment, you'll be good as new soon enough. The delicate hand of Elsa flipped the page as soon as my eyes met the final mark. Your hearing is a coin flip now, though. We cannot guarantee that it'll be saved. If we get the mallow off, it has to be through scraping, and that's not a procedure I want to do on you. It certainly removes the mallow and frees you of its risks but it also risks the removal of over 78% of your hearing. The mallow isn't progressing aggressively with you, which is completely unheard of. If we give you antibiotics, we risk disturbing it. If we give you bacteriophage treatment, we won't kill it outright. We inject bacteriophages into your spine and let it get to work fighting the mallow, so the treatment will be used to protect and secure your vital organs used to recover your eardrum, hopefully. But it will not be able to fight the mallow if it keeps spreading through just the bone, and we'll need to monitor it closely. The treatment will just keep it from spreading into your organs, which admonishes its only form of weaponizing itself. My eyes fluttered at the brutal honesty on display, the realization that this isn't a joke. These people were genuinely waging life and death with the planet, and wanted to spend their time helping me. They're serious. An honest crew, these people should have been the ones I was sent down with to start. They handed me a pencil, and my mind fell completely apart. I was shattered from the moment its wooden body touched my hand. I glared at the paper without motion, captivated by its perfectly printed baby blue lines. I wrote down the only three words that I could think of. Let's do it. A terrifying injection device of crude craftsmanship, offset by the smooth, beautiful hands of Ms. Elsa, was brandished deliberately in the air before me. My back shivered as my spine sprouted millipede legs. I shook and rocked with increasing veracity, just glaring at such a horrific tool. She looked back at me and shot me a warm smile, one that penetrated even the bitter cold of this submerged base. Within a flash of a moment, she loaded the odd contraption with a small, palm-sized bottle of odd liquid. Her hand motioned it in the air. She clicked three small levers on it, and it started up with a powerful hiss that echoed through the room. Its warbled voice finally shriveled when she calmed it with a couple more clicks. It resembled a pistol, with a grip looking exactly like one. Same trigger mechanism in everything yet melted onto its top half is a metal framework. Within said frame rests the most horrific component, a computer-operated pneumatic syringe. The body of it was cylindrical, of course, with a crude exterior mount made of metal amalgam, melted into the frame. Along its length were tubes and wires, respectively organized above and below one another. The tubes hooked into the plunger, which was filled with the odd liquid. The tip of the syringe was the worst bit, a disc of various metal pipes attached to the glass tube, with three full needle tips protruding from the front. I pointed at it, eyes glazed and skin pale, and Ms. Elsa returned with that warm smile and pointed at the needles directly with an inquisitive look. I nodded, and she pulled Maxie over to briefly demonstrate. She held the gun at the base of his neck, more specifically the C7 and T1 vertebrae, with the longer upper needle pointed at the C7, 
the shorter lower needle pointed at T1, and the mid-length middle needle pointed squarely between the two. Both needles were going into the vertebrae directly, and the intention was to flood my CSF with bacteriophages built to defend against mallow. I nodded, still pale and shivering. Elsa walked over to me slowly. Calmly, she sat down beside me. A waft of lavender with a hint of strawberry clouded my nose for nary a moment. A pleasant moment. Her red lips pursed into a tight, cute smile, and her hand rested gently on the bottom of my jaw. Maxie and Ron closed in, with Ron placing his hands on my shoulders. My eyes faced forward as I felt the alcohol dab on my neck. I quivered. Elsa kept my gaze forward, facing Ron, who was assuring me and painstakingly mouthing the words, You're okay, as he nodded. Behind me, I heard the machine click to life. The pressurization was garbled into intricately rhythmic, clishing noises in time with my heartbeat. My hands were placed on the metal table I was resting on. My eyes locked in a dire glare into Ron's eyes. Any moment I looked away, I heard a distracting sound that redirected me to Ron and Maxie. Elsa's hand was placed on my shoulder, and she squeezed me slightly. The hissing came to a high-pitched halt, and my eyes opened wider than they'd ever been opened. The click, then crack, then clunk of the machine. Its minute mechanical motions being mimicked by my entire head as it jerked terribly in time with it. I couldn't see. I couldn't feel. I could only cry quietly. I did so, and the warbled hissing continued, and the ramshackle torture gun in my neck continued to jerk and shake horrifically. Soon enough, my pain was relieved with a resounding crack and a neat click. The syringe was removed delicately, and I heard the audible clink of her gently placing it down. I shook desperately. I couldn't feel my neck. I couldn't feel my body. Only cold. My vision trembled, blurring Ron and Maxie into momentous lines that came and went whenever they pleased. In my ears was ringing, loud shouting with banging and crashing, hurried footsteps and rampant shrieking. My thoughts were awash in a cloud of confusion, of fear and horror. I could feel my fingers slowly bend and break, snapping into place as I curled them with all my strength. Soon my hands were clenched into fists. I could hear it all now. All the screaming and all the words nobody wished anyone would hear. I could hear voices once more, and their panic was immense, speaking of an exploding patient whose blood wouldn't stop pouring. And I was met with a warm hand on my face that pulled me into the incredibly warm fabric. Instantly, something was there. I was less alone than I was. The hand was Elsa's. My eyes still shook, but I could make it out. She covered my mouth and held me to her shoulder. Her warmth radiated through me, slowly. It enveloped me and took me into a deep slumber. The final time I awoke was arguably the worst. In a grandiose panic, I flew out of bed in direct response to blaring red alarms. Hands trembling, I clothed myself, grabbed my plasma cutter, and booked it down the hall. In the lounge area, there is, mounted on the wall, a large screen. It was on and playing some rather strange sounds, like garbled bubbles being pressurized and sucked through a narrow shaft, with a resounding bassy grumble following whenever it halted. I almost mistook the screen for being off, but various translucent particles floated and flurried near the source of the feed, being illuminated as they passed the light mounted on the camera. The alarm still screaming, I heard a warbled, lightly pitched voice behind me. It was Elsa. I turned to see her and Ron. Her gaze was locked onto me, and Ron's was locked on the screen. Elsa approached with a clipboard. On it was written, Maxie went out to investigate high anomalous activity in the cavity. He left, and within minutes the activity spiked. The feed went dark, and all we could hear was his screaming. Once we managed to hook back into his feed, we couldn't hear or see anything. He's not moving, and the screen is locked onto his external camera feed. We can't find the internal one. 
I nodded and looked again at the TV. Ron was standing in front of it with a luminous keyboard under his hands. He was typing spastically with a number of small windows popping up while he worked. Elsa grabbed my shoulder and speed walked me to the airlock. She pointed to a suit, a real derelict suit, and I took it as a sign to put it on. It took a few minutes, but by the time I was ready, Ron was standing beside me in his own suit. He motioned for me to get closer, and when I did, he clicked a tiny electronic device into the back of my helmet. The glass encompassing the faceplate is incredibly thick. Between the layers is one tiny layer of invisible polymer. This polymer only becomes visible once a certain kind of light is shown on it, the same light that is beamed from projectors within the helmet. The projectors are next to my neck and above my head, but they all point to specific places on the glass, making clear visible text whenever they beam the light onto it. This device he clicked in was an auxiliary attachment, enabling text-to-speech functionality. Within seconds, I could see Ron's words spoken to me through clear baby blue neon text on my faceplate. Do you read me? I almost wished the device had the capability to italicize. My joy was incomparable. I said yes back, and I could see the word appear just under his question. With a wide smile, Ron patted me on the back and stuffed into my hands a railgun, built to operate under these pressures. Along with this, he handed me a small satchel, which had five extra payloads I could use with the gun and a spare battery cell to keep it charged. Our target was the massive cavity our base was beside, the very one that had the Alpha base suspended within its gullet. Maxi's signal was found directly on top of Alpha, meaning we would need to travel along the support ropes. Below the base is the planet's very own jaw, Metaphorically, of course, it really is a gargantuan tube leading down into a more narrow shaft. At the top of the chasm, you can barely see the opposite side, yet near the bottom, you can easily hold yourself up with both arms extended. There is a hole down there, it's just larger than a human, and it has always fumed a viscous black smoke. This smoke is theorized to be the origin of Mallow. Delta Base was made to investigate this stuff directly, and they've been requiring a sample from the bottom of the pit. Perhaps if I were to fall off the rope, I just might survive and help the station too. The only issue with exploring the cavity is its jailer anomaly. Jailers are huge creatures, completely disinterested in leaving their homes, and aggressive towards those who intrude and attempt to leave. This specific jailer is that of a Lofid, specifically the species Lasiognathus amphorhampus. If it were hyper-evolved to be larger than all our bases, and twice as brutal in a fight. A wolf trap angler bigger than our comprehension. That's what lurks within the chasm. Despite being a part of the Thaumatict, this family, the creature has evolved to be more similar to a Oneridide, a dreamer. Dreamer Lofids wander the reaches of the deep sea, completely dazed by their own esca and awaiting prey to swiftly eat. This jailer mimics this to an extreme, despite its form being far more geared to assault creatures. Its lengthy body swirls gently within the cavity, slowly encircling its black depths, lost in a deadlock glare with its esca. Our operation will involve us quietly getting on top of the base, finding Maxi, and leaving the moment we have him. No noise unless completely necessary. We are going in with nothing but our suits and whatever equipment we can carry on it. Powerful pressure flooded the airlock, filling it with icy cold waters and submerging us. Once filled, a moment of silence before the alarm banged on and the doors slowly opened. The outside was pitch black, nighttime, and you could hear the distant rumble of engines and creatures. The machine yard's lights were on full, and grand spotlights illuminated miles of its wreckage-laden region, with intermixed colors from various plates and remaining ships poking through the dense shades of gray and blue. You could make out the gouged innards of the starships, 
warp and flux engines pouring across the plateaus, and a rather beautifully preserved capital ship in the center, being the primary focus of the spotlights. You could also see the drones the machine yard employs, like miniature submarines, the size of a man with a number of articulated arms. These metallic zeppelins were surreal. They glided along with no effort or care, no emotion or character. Just steel balloons idly moving. Above the yard, gently illuminated, were its protectors, the larger submarines that were built strictly to gore any creatures that came near. These submarines rivaled the jailers. They were absolutely massive, and it was clear evidence of the yard's anomalous nature. It's unlikely the size of its protectors was a random decision. It clearly responded to the jailers and adapted as necessary, and those vessels still continue to have design flaws, proving it's still evolving the design. Despite being able to see grand metal death machines in the distance, it became clear to us why the protectors were out. Lots of anomalous activity across the planet, Maxi was merely investigating a growing epicenter. Above our heads were dozens of creatures of all sizes, including some that were youthful jailers. They swarmed and encircled the machine yard, pressuring its drones and protectors from all ends. Whenever a distant blip resounded from one of the creatures, a responding roar of engines was heard, with an occasional bang and crash as they clashed. Ron directed me to the chasm, trying his damnedest to keep me distracted from everything around us. In the distance, I could see the exit from the tram I took, with its mouth now regurgitating viscous black smoke and droplets of limpid liquid, similar to what I saw as I traveled through it. Below in the trenches was more of this smoke, billowing recklessly towards the machine yard and pooling beneath it. Our sights were soon set upon the faded red bulbs mounted upon metal pillars atop the Alpha base. We stood next to one of the great clamps, holding the base up, with its massive cable extending into the dark nothing. About six feet across, but entirely cylindrical, making slipping too easy. Text appeared suddenly on my visor, a message from Ron telling me to enable my magnets. These suits can be divided into four separate modules, the helmet, the chest rig, the pelvis rig, and the boots. The rest is covered in plates. The helmet houses the communication and surveillance modules, the chest houses life support and backup power, and the pelvis has pneumatic strength modules that allow the user to walk around on the seafloor, regardless of depth. This is where the power goes that requires a backup. Finally, the boots have magnetic locks inside that allow you to latch onto any metal surface. Other suits have different modules in different places. Really, these ones were designed for this planet. I texted back to Ron that I had no idea how to activate mine. He took a knee and clicked a few things on my ankles. Eventually, I saw the magnets were active on my visor, with battery indicators to let me know how close to dead they were. I raised one foot and planted it onto the cable. It locked into place and I could feel the intensity of the neodymium magnets beneath it. I planted my next foot and took the lead, balance beaming my way into an infinite abyss. My feet clambered and shook as I violently twitched in hectic response to a fluttering argonaut, one which soared inches from my face. Its shell was uncanny, looking like a human hand's bones had melded with it. The gelatinous body had numerous tendrils that trailed delicately behind it, one nearly latching onto my faceplate. The actual creature dwarfed my head, but its tendrils were no thicker than my index finger. I corrected my stance and continued onwards. While having an interrupting Argonaut may have been terrifying, my terror was primarily under the skin. It had been building from our walk. There was vast nothingness all around me. I couldn't even see the cable. Looking down revealed my legs that jankily moved forward, meekly seeking another spot to plant my foot. Trepidation was bountiful, and I felt invisible syringes piercing my muscles as I moved. Lifting my foot was similar to raising my thigh into a bed of laser-thin needles, 
with my muscles spasming and twitching in response to the intangible sensation. Something as simple as putting my weight on my foot became a terrible challenge, with every effort being met with violent spasms that knocked my balance around. Ron, on numerous occasions, had to hold me upright. He sent a text as we passed the halfway point. It said, Take it easy. You've been trained to deal with this shit. Not long after that, I received another text. It was a broad transmission from Elsa. Big warning. The jailer below you guys is sending out signals. It's making the machine yard anxious. Expect to see a flotilla of drones headed your way. They're surveyors so they lack aggressive capability. If they get close, stay still and wait for them to pass. They'll likely go into the chasm and die by the jailer. Not necessarily comforting, but I wasn't deterred. I neglected to mention to Ron that I do have a primal fear still laced in me. Machines, underwater ones more specifically. When I see the ocean, I don't think of machines. I don't think of gargantuan metal contraptions moving with perfect precision. Seeing a ship's turbine, a massive rotating fan, is already a brutally horrifying sight to me. But tack on to it the crushing depth, the water that controls you. If the turbine activates while underwater, it could suck you into its fan blades. And you have no choice in the matter. Engines sound much louder beneath the water, and you can even feel their bellowing voice as they pass. Metal moves with no weight down here. I grew up on Prometheus, so I was used to the idea of space doing the same thing. But this isn't space. It's an ocean. Suffice it to say this fear is an irrational one, but one I have yet to overcome. The machine yard is an absolute nightmare to me, and I'll do anything necessary to avoid it. As I contemplated submersible mechatronics, I felt the guiding hand of Ron on my shoulder. He pushed me down so I knelt, placing my hand on the metal cable. It became instantly clear why he did this. Our helmets had mounted upon them one light, a mere fog lamp in all reality. You can barely see in front of you with it. Perhaps a good 10 FT is illuminated by the lamp, with its luminescence dying after that distance. Well. Imagine my horror when I looked to my left and saw nothing but a huge metal plate lowering next to us. One of the drones thought its engine was off. After the first one was out of sight, we saw another, and then another. The front end of one was very close. Ron had to scooch forward a bit to avoid nicking it. With our lights combined, we could see one of the drones in full bloom. I got to watch as a great metal coffin slowly descended with no noise. Its nose just listed carefully downwards, seemingly evading the cables intentionally. My body trembled, and my eyes began to shake as I watched. Dim red lights mounted upon its own metallic spines drifted down fluidly. The kick of one of their engines startled me into motion. I began to inch forward on the cable, desperate to feel solid ground or at least steel floors. Now only the bitter hum and whir of the propellers as well as a growing growl emitting from the deep. Colors began to intensify, blooming into glared spots in my vision wherever light struck. My hands felt like liquid, my feet were numb. Ron once again stopped me, another Argonaut passed by. But this one was even more strange. It was following the drones, and despite the first one being of purplish pigment, this one was a strong saturated red. Its tendrils seemed different, denser, as if there was a spine within its gelatinous body. They curled and straightened with cruel motions, bending and snapping to achieve whatever shape they desired. A frill protruded from between the tiny suction cups on them, looking like flayed pinkish skin. It had one eye, misshapen and obtuse in proportion with the rest of the body, like it was shoved into place, cloudy yet stricken with barrow trauma, bloodshot. Upon the top was a rather large dorsal fin, constructed out of zooid colonies that stretched down into longer, more dense-looking tendrils. We readily assumed its limbs to be dangerous, so we remained still and watched it pass. 
Finally, even the drones were out of sight, no more noise aside from a distant blare set off by the propeller's motion. We continued, watching all around for any more Argonauts, or Mano Wars, or whatever else these things may resemble. Finally, I could see the grim corner of the suspended Alpha base. Each cable was clamped onto the base and woven over the top to another clamp before being brought to the opposite end of the chasm to be clamped at the cliff making a sort of X formation where the cables cross over the roof. Beside that X is the entrance shaft. Maxi's source of his feed was there, but we couldn't see a body. It seemed like he was searching for a way in, but something happened to make him panic. A strange growl with numerous blips interspersed sounded our arrival. I immediately followed the cross and searched for where Maxi may have ended up. What I found was rather unfortunate only the camera from his helmet. It was lying there, light still beaming onto the cables. Ron caught up and saw for himself. He sent me a text saying, Damn. All right, listen, I figured something like this would happen. He hasn't responded to our attempts to communicate. My bet is that he's inside the base, fucked up from Mallow or whatever else is in there. Whatever else is in there, I was almost offended how many things are on this planet and how many of them want all of us to die. I started to get a little agitated. Were they still not being honest with me? I've been down here long enough. I've seen so much. Where does it end? I sent him a text asking, at what point does this place stop throwing new shit at you? I wanted an answer, despite the question being ridiculous. I got an answer, not from Ron, but from Elsa. It read, never. Cold text, right there. Toneless honesty from her. On this one cable I've seen enough. In the tram I saw enough. In that damn base I saw enough. Now I wonder for how long they've seen enough. I looked over at the access chute. It was a top fill airlock, doors still open. We hopped in and pulled the switch. The door slammed shut and the water was being pumped out. Red lights kicked on, the water was emptied, and the door did not open. It most certainly tried. We heard it pull and get stuck on something. We hit the button again, and this time it tried a little harder, though we could hear the door's painful resistance. Finally, Ron decided to just pull them open. He tugged and was met with the excruciating squishy crunch of that mallow growing within the damn door. We almost wished we hadn't opened it, as we instantly were exposed to more gore. A blood eagle. Someone's ribs were ripped out their back, and their lungs were mounted upon them. Blood cascaded the walls, a scream resembling that of a chalkboard wheezed from down the hall, and we heard a clearly human voice shouting from the lower levels. One hell of a base they have here. Security must have been tight. Me and Ron were still frozen in the airlock, glaring at this gored person before us. I sent him a quick text asking, what the hell happened here? His swift response was, I have no fucking idea. We inched forward, quietly. I peered around a pillar in the center of the room to see a rather mutagenic humanoid. Two legs, yes that's for certain, but the torso had expanded to twice its size fingers growing from within latching into the skin on the pelvis and thighs, keeping its exploded ribcage low. The neck was elongated with a shrunken, perhaps cavitated head. It turned and I could confirm, yes, its skull was actually half collapsed into itself. I held back vomit as I aimed my railgun, no question before I shot it, sending a violent electrical payload through it and three other rooms. The shot rang out, the creature cried with an ear-piercing shrill squeal as its midsection was removed, along with half of its enormous ribcage. More shrill voices started a choir. Said chorus was on its way to us with hundreds of bashing and banging noises as they trampled all in their path to get to our room. Quadrupedal humanoids with viciously elongated limbs that stuck out from the skin. I fired through two of them and a few more rooms while Ron unloaded a full salvo from his magazine-eroding mutated people 
as they piled before him. I left this upper floor in ruins. While the flesh of all the monsters certainly cushioned the impact, I was still using a railgun. Ron had a far different weapon, one designed for fighting in these environments. A simple kinetic assault rifle kitted out to survive under pressure. It certainly works, I can affirm that. The minor skirmish was over quickly, with only a few twitching bodies left to stomp as we made our way through. It became clear to me that this was not a base that was meant to be inhabited. Blood was everywhere. Whatever mess we left from our fight merely blended with the rest of the station. From the floors and behind staircases to the ceilings, this place was horrible. My hearing was surprisingly acute in here. It had been slowly clearing as we made our way through the chasm, but I'd been hesitant to mention that to them. I worry about their intentions. I'm no fool. I know the derelict's fate. These anomalies are dangerous, only sometimes do we make it out. Made me wonder about Ron and how he's managed to become a veteran, while still being unrecognized as one. Even Elsa, such a chipper lady in the face of all this, it doesn't make sense. As we explored more of the visceral wonderland, I parted from Ron more and more. For some reason, I had the inclination that I must be distant, that I needed to be out of sight from him. I went to the back of the first room we entered, a lobby of sorts, and I moved immediately for the staircase to the right. Ron texted saying, I'm gonna go down the left stairs, we should end up in the same room. I felt off about the text, about the stairs. Entering the stairwell only reinforced my trepidation. I looked down to see crimson waves, no metal was visible from beneath the pool. Calmly, quietly, slowly. I descended the staircase with my eyes locked on the closed door below. My foot sunk into the pool of blood, and I yanked it back out swiftly. The pool was higher than the bottom of the door. It hasn't been opened in ages. I used the tip of my railgun to poke the door switch without having to step into the puddle. It screed open, the blood spilled out, and I could see a vast room lit by a powerful blue hue, with a man crouched in the center bleeding. Just as my door opened and I could see the man, the door on the opposite end of the room opened too, and I could spot Ron. Ron inched forward first. He clicked something on his helmet and began speaking. While I couldn't distinguish most words, I could actually hear his voice, and I could make an attempt to understand him. He was talking to the man. His voice was coming through the helm. He was saying Maxie over and over. The man on the floor finally looked over at him. Then he turned to me. It was Maxi, all right. His eyes were red as hell. Blood was pouring in gentle tears down his face. And all he did was lower his head onto the floor in front of him. He was in front of a large window. I figured this room to be an observatory of sorts. If it was, I didn't understand how he could see anything outside. It was pitch black. This was answered when we approached. The luminance was coming from a massive sphere, just inches from the glass. Its radiance was unbelievable, almost blinding. I looked to Ron to see his glare fixated on Maxie. Taking that as a sign, I tried my best not to look at the glowing orb. Elsa shot us a text. We've seen enough. I've got everything on record. You can finish him off and come back. I asked her, aren't we going to save him? Wasn't that the point of this? She responded very quickly. Do not look out the window, I repeat. Do not look out the window. Maxie is gone. You can leave him alive or kill him. It's up to you. We just needed to know what happened to him. I pressed the topic. What the hell was this for? Why was he down here? You said it was to investigate high anomalous activity. Is this what you meant? Did you just want him dead? Her tone-deaf response was shocking. No. I wanted to see what would happen. He worked for Gosok. He's not my concern. He never was. You are a derelict. This shouldn't be hard for you. I looked at Ron, whose face was grim. He was staring at Maxie with sad eyes. I asked him, Are we really just gonna leave him? Ron's eyes shot to me 
His mouth moved with no noise. Then I received the text. He's gone. She's right, we're trained to see even worse things. This shouldn't be difficult. He lowered his gun, but it is. I didn't want to hear it. I got down and grabbed Maxie by the shoulders, lifting him upright. His eyes were glazed over. He was watching the light. I tugged and pulled him trying to get him on his feet. He was just sitting there, dead weight. Finally, I just got frustrated and pulled him out of the light off to the side and Ron followed me trying to stop me. The moment he was out of the light, all hell broke loose. The light shut off with wild and rampant wailing from outside, shrieking followed by banging and thrashing of metal. The entire base shifted on its axis and we could hear the cables strain from inside. Another wail signaled the base being struck violently from outside, knocking us onto the floor and denting the outer walls of the base. Maxi began to flail his body recklessly, slamming his elbow square into my chest and knocking me into the wall. He kicked Ron away and flew back into the center of the room, screaming, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Over and again, like a child who got discovered stealing, he began to cry the words, even bawling. The flurry of gargantuan movement outside only worsened, and now the light flickered in and out over Maxi. With each passing flare, he screamed, No! Louder and louder, until finally one wallop on the station knocked a cable loose. The base tilted. Me and Ron fell onto one another and slid down the floor towards the wall with the window. The stairwell door was right next to us, and there were tons of random equipment and furniture falling right for the window. Thankfully, we closed the door. The last thing I saw in that room was Maxi being slammed into the window and a selection of heavy objects falling from behind him. I heard the glass smash. I heard Maxi's last scream being cut short and I heard the water break into that room, tugging the entire base further into the abyss. Screaming of unnatural origins flooded the entirety of the inside. More mutants. Ron pulled me to my feet and urged me to follow. We fled through the stairs and climbed our way back to the airlock. Pulling the switch, the room fills once more. Ron and I are in a sheer panic, with no clarity in our motions. As the room flooded, we heard bodies slam against the inside door, slapping of hands and limbs against its frame. When the airlock door opened, we bolted out and climbed to a nearby clamp. The current surrounding us was so fervent we could barely see. Our bodies were being thrown all over with only our grips keeping us in place. I looked up at the cable. My headlamp illuminated a nearby machine drone that was hovering just above us, terrifying me and forcing me to scream. Just as I let it out, some kind of creature much larger than it carelessly thwacked its tail end into the drone, making it fly just over us and into the chasm wall bouncing off and unfortunately striking right into another cable. It snapped, and now the base dangled on an axis with no anchor. If one more cable gets struck, the entire base is lost. The machine that withstood the blow ascended rapidly, imploding into reddish mist just outside the chasm. Things flurried and flailed into place, eventually settling down with only auditory cues as to the true chaos taking place away from us. Ron asked, you alright? Any injuries? I responded, no. And he did not waste a moment in telling me to climb. As fast as we could, we enabled our magnets and booked it up the cable, slowing down to a near halt just moments afterward. Unfortunately, the drones were hovering just above the cable we were mounted on. I was mere feet from its cold shell as it lowered from the darkness. There was a strong current tugging me towards its whirling propellers. A surreal calm overtook me once I illuminated its rotating tail. From between the sheets of metal, and even from behind the propeller itself, you could see flesh. Dangling, being pulled along in circles, tightening around its center. From this, flesh and blood flew into the water, and the bestial sub was moving forward with slow speed, clearly anxious. A horrific machine bellowed from behind us. I turned around, and my light flashed over the bottom of a much larger sub. One with numerous ports on the bottom, and an attached gunnery section. 
It emitted ominous blips along with its terrible grumble as it surreally fell into the chasm. This wasn't a missile. It was a whole tower falling into the chasm geared for war. My whole body shook violently. My teeth chattered spastically and a taunting message from Ron shot onto my screen. We gotta move, man! I started screaming, no idea what I said. I was babbling and ranting like a child whilst clutching the cable as if it could keep me safe. I trembled. No part of me remained still. I couldn't manage it. All of it. I mean, what kind of fucking planet is this? What the hell happened? Why does something alien use ancient submarines? How are these creatures so violently mutated and evolved? What does this mallow have to do with it? No answer. Only a cold text from Elsa saying, stay calm, everything will be fine, so long as you move. Understand? Panting, gasping for air, I nodded like she was watching. Another text. Everything is fine, just keep moving. I looked forward through the tears welling in my eyes. I watched the top of the drone disappear below the cable. I heard no motion nor movement from below, but the thought of what will occur is my main fear. Pulling my foot up, I clicked off my original position and slid forward. Again and again. I fixated on the sensation of the magnets. Guttural growls emitted from below caught me off guard. I stopped again, but only for a moment. I started counting the steps, beginning with one and ending at three. Upon my third step, things took a turn for the worse. A roar shook the waters, an ear-rupturing bang from below and that metallic drone came flying towards us. It hit the cable, lifting the alpha base awkwardly, only to be thrown into the chasm floor. Its impact was the worst part. The eruption was enormous, and it detonated right on a fault in the cliff face. The cliff shattered, destroying the clamp holding our cable up. We felt the weight of everything shift. I could feel the whole world collapse and rotate on its gutted organs. I looked to my side and saw a vague moon fleeing from me as my surroundings darkened into an inky crescendo. The base was above my head now. I looked up to see the exploded window and what I believed to be bits of Maxi. My eyes washed over. My thoughts faded from me. It all fell apart once I hit the ground. A terrible slam and I was pinned under the weight of the cable. Ron wasn't in sight. Just me and the odd benthic of the chasm. It had strange growths on its floor, one which served as a cushion for me. The growths spewed the odd luminescent ooze from the tram, though it encompassed my body wholly now. Perhaps that's why I couldn't feel my leg, which resembled a used toothpaste tube. I had finally accepted my fate, but I was unsatisfied that I had to suffocate. Calm's dead. I looked at my surroundings. Now sound returned to me, as did my panic. I saw bits of metal falling down, stuff from within the base had been slowly descending upon me. Above my position was a body, enormous, moving like a serpent through the waters. It roared, deafening me once more, and I watched as it darted from my view, and I felt an impact unlike any other. Another explosion. This time right on the chasm wall, the massive sub's body fell quickly into the center. I braced and it collapsed right through the chasm floor. Like a rock through paper, it shattered the stones effortlessly, tearing a new bottom into the cavity. I resided upon a ledge, unable to move, still pinned. But I could certainly see the new abyss. I had never thought there could exist anything blacker and darker than space. This abyss proved me wrong. It swallowed my light, replacing it with its own. This false light had eaten the massive sub. I hadn't a clue as to where it went. Perhaps that's just how deep it is, that just the new chasm swallowed it. Finally, my mind came back to me. I blinked thrice and instantly began communicating, trying to reach either of the other two. I got a swift response from Elsa. Are you alright? What happened? Before I could finish answering, I got a text from Ron. Where are you? The base is about to fall. 
I told Elsa what happened. All the while, I blinked my headlamp on and off while looking up, hoping Ron could see it. He did, thankfully, and the man approached my crumpled body. He's seriously injured, Elsa. I don't know how I can get him out. He said in clear words over the radio. Shit. Well, maybe you could leave him behind? Elsa's voice responded. I was stunned. I stammered and held my speech back. Perhaps they assumed I still couldn't hear. I can't fathom why I could suddenly, but I could make out every word. Nah, we couldn't get Maxie out of here. He still helped us. This guy he hasn't even been able to. He's been getting beat up since we found him. I almost wanted to cry seeing someone recognize humanity in me. Then, the cold crept back in. Look, I understand what you mean, but we're on our way out. Leave him and you'll actually make it off the planet. We've got a lot of new research, a transport's coming in a day or two. And I urge them to try tomorrow morning. If you can get him out of there, he's coming with, yeah. But don't go risking your neck for nothing. At this point, my blood felt like liquid ice. I looked at Ron, who was glaring at me with deep contemplation. He nodded, looked at my crushed leg, and pulled out a plasma cutter. I got a text saying, This is gonna hurt. You're getting a prosthetic leg. Just as my eyes glazed over those last words, a purplish light shocked the waters and soared downwards, and shearing pain rocketed through my leg. I looked down to see him jankily cutting through my thigh. Instant pain. Instantaneous regret for everything I had ever done to wind up down here. I screamed again. I cried. The moment the pain stopped, so did I. The shock was so tremendous that I couldn't process what just happened. Ron grabbed my arm, lifted me to his shoulder, and started climbing the rock face. I was lethargic, completely and royally screwed. My emotions were flooding me all at once in saturated assaults, yet I couldn't feel a single one or respond to any sensation. I was numb, but I could feel every ounce of regret and pain coursing through my veins and leaking out my leg. I could feel something looking at us, something big. I turned to see that very orb Maxie was fixated on, now looking at us. The whole thing was sheer white, with no pigment. Yet it seemed the upper layers were where the bioluminescence was held. The lower layers stood out as darker grays, and the whole thing moved in a strange, ocean-like bombardment of shapes. Large circles would collapse painfully into perfect squares. Those squares would erode into rectangles and octagons, eventually leading back into the circles. Each circle resembled a pond of gelatinous gray ooze, with its own waves and patterns that encapsulate its movement. I received a text, but I couldn't read it. I couldn't take my eyes off the waves. The squares shot into the skull with an infinite staircase of other squares, perpetuating the shape until it became a clear rectangle, with the change being lost as you watch. Memories fade, shifting in and out. Nothing matters now. I leaned forward, receiving another text before Ron's hands released my own. I faltered. I fell onto the shelf I was on before. I saw the cable and the gore of my appendage. I saw the edge of the abyss rapidly encroaching. My one knee struck the rocks, and my torso folded forwards, plummeting my skull into the Stygian veil. I could finally read the text now. It read, Come on, stop pulling me off the wall. And the final one read, What are you doing? I blinked and it was gone. All of it. Like an illusory veil had formed and shattered upon my eyes, tainting my eyelids with hallucinogenic visions that drove my mind into deep, existential contemplation. Sobriety washed over me, and my mind somehow clicked back in place, slightly ajar. I was falling, and above me, some magnificent creature continued to war with metal abominations from my deepest nightmares. The only barrier between me and the chasm was a shattered hole, wide enough to fit a damn base through. There are likely bits of Maxi floating about down here alongside me, 
Pressure isn't kind to a human body, whether it's alive or dead. I was abandoned by Ron and Elsa, who I thought were acting in my best interests. I can understand Ron dropping me. I was in a daze and a liability, but I'm still shocked at how quickly he did it. Maybe I fell farther than I thought, who knows? All I knew was that I was doomed. I looked around me, terrified at what I may see. Nobody had made it this far beneath the waters of Lamia One. Now I understand why. My suit was breaking. I was losing blood rapidly, and I had no stem gel on my suit to stop it. While my movement has been restricted due to a deadlock glare with my trailing blood mist, I did eventually attempt to move. I chose to do the worst thing you could possibly do when falling through the ocean. I looked down. Below me was infinite black, with small nodules being illuminated prominently in the vast nothingness by my light, which flickers every so often. I saw nothing. There was just nothing. I was falling into the inescapable hands of this ocean's deepest predators. One of them calmly made themselves evident much to my screaming response. It was no beast. In some lengthy string, moving as a snake does, numerous bulbs igniting the waters with intense red light. They danced in a line as if suspended by a marionette paddle. It swayed and sauntered as I sunk, bubbles rising from small cracks in my helmet becoming more pronounced as my depth increased. A ringing sound rose from my right ear, and the puppet approached. Its motions were captivating. My eyes hurt from looking at it, but I couldn't look away. It quietly closed the gap between us, swirling and swishing its body in playful ways. As it came closer, my light began to reveal more. Strange masses of reddish matter spewed into spiderweb-esque cloaks that encompassed a sort of bony central spine. I thought I saw some more flesh, but my light shut off at this moment. In a panicked reflex, I slammed my fist into my chest, hitting a button that activated my SOS beacon. Six lights appear on our body, and mine will only have five given a missing footlight. They are bright and annoying lights that pulse from specific parts on our suits. It's our last hope, and most of us are taught to take comfort when we see our own beacons turn on. It means it's almost over. That relief I felt. I genuinely felt it. My chest collapsed calmly, my mind turned into a warm slurry, and my eyes slowly welled with tears. I wanted to cry, I just wanted to let it out. Finally, all of this damn pain would be over. This was a highly emotional state that was brought on by blood loss. I was screwed, my body was shredded from the pressure, the fact I was conscious was a miracle. Then the lights finally wrapped around me. A brilliant scarlet tint with hints of orange in the center. Gently illuminated soft zoic layers acting as exterior bulbs wafted along with the current, its enormous body slowly circling me, hundreds of feet in length. I feared the worst. I was completely ready for it, though. The creature possessed many stomachs. Its body moved as a serpent with all of its organs strung out along its spine, dangling from it as smaller, strange organs pumping water through themselves to give propulsion. The lights began to fall, but the creature certainly didn't. It remained above, trickling even more glowing bulbs in lengthy, jellyfish-esque tendrils that were fast approaching me. My bet was that this thing has nematocysts within those tendrils and that contact with them would ensure my demise. I closed my eyes slightly and watched the lights come down. Suddenly, my SOS lights began to flicker. I could feel blood trickling down my face as they started. It was incredibly startling. These beacons are built to respond to corresponding signals with the same frequency. They flash when someone is nearby with the same signal. The strobe effect was apparently unpleasant for the creature to sustain. It moved quite quickly to get off me. This momentary joyous confusion was replaced by screaming disgust, skin ripping shrieking, pant exploding, teeth crackling, mind melting horror. 
as a black metal coffin stormed into the cavern, ripping open the chasm's floor a bit more, and likely demolishing itself. The terror had erupted in my bones, my movements were like swimming in shattered glass, and my eyes teared as I glared at what I thought to be my fate. Luckily, I was wrong about that. I was far too unstable at this point to understand anything. The visage of the submarine just snapped whatever sanity I was holding on to. I was crying and blabbing again, completely melted down and incoherent. It wasn't until later that I found out this sub was there to save me. Elsa and Ron were aboard, and they pushed as hard as they could to get me into stasis. It worked, surprisingly, and I've been in recovery for about 10 months. Most of me is prosthetic, my leg was replaced by the best brand in the market, and my lower half was almost completely replaced too. Ron was impressed. He said there was no way I should have survived, Elsa claims it too. I can even hear them now. My hearing is returning slowly but surely. This hardly means I have been freed from my contract, however. I'm still working for Omic and they always want more out of their derelicts. Prometheus gets upset when they stop investigating anomalies. That means they need more fodder. I'm getting shipped out again, already, in about four months. Supposed to be a nice and easy observation, just going onto a planet and watching a crash site that's been reported to be anomalous. Nobody knows where the ships are from and nobody can even get close to them. Guess I'm the one to poke the bear. Omic also extended my contract while subtracting my pay claiming that if the sub they used to extract me got attacked, they would have lost a good amount of money. Really, I think it's for the damn stasis machine. I was in it for about two months until my body was actually stable again. Stem cell treatment, barotraumatic treatment, and then prosthetica treatment. The prosthetics keep me alive. At least hopefully my next mission will go over much more smoothly. Sean Durtesky, 2146